Hi, I'm Joel. It's day 3,239. Uh, this is day 3,240 of my running streak. I haven't missed a day since January the 1st, 2011. It's a bit of a chilly day. I'm in Henley-on-Thames by the River and Rowing Museum. There's a really good reason for that. Uh, I'm about to do three miles and you're coming with me. Let's go. <laughs> So nice to see you. Very nice to see you today. I've the huge pleasure of running with, oh, how do I introduce you? Olympian, I guess that's the best thing. You could call him Olympic gold medalist. Olympi if you want. Olympic gold medalist. Three Olympic medalists. Greg Sill, thank you so much for coming out. That's, it's a real pleasure to meet you, having read your book and read all about you. But to have the privilege of uh, running with you, I tell you what, I'd rather run with you than row with you because you'd definitely leave me for standing. Yeah, well, no, I'd, I'd probably rather run with you than row with you as well, because there's <laughs> nothing like pulling someone along in a double skull. Yes, that's true. Um, that was but, uh, uh, no, we'd have fun. We would have fun if we went rowing. I, um, and I do often go rowing with people who haven't rowed much before. I, well, that's but, how no, we... Nice uh, run's good. That's how we sort of ended up coming to run together, because my friend Saad Chowdhury, I think, uh, he, he did some rowing with you for charity. That's and he right, said, yeah. Super nice guy, you've got to run with him. And oh, no, that's really nice. That was actually with a charity called Access Sport. Um, and I was at one of their events last night, and it's amazing that you've done this, this running streak. <laughs> because uh, when we talk about excess sport, it's about trying to get kids out and exercising and running. And it basically has the idea that, you know, exercise is a wonder drug. It is. And obviously you're the one who, uh, you're an addict. I am to some extent. I mean, it's, I've, uh, I've been trying to encourage my own children to, to run, but it's difficult. Yeah. Because... All sport is inherently difficult. Yes. But as an adult, you kind of learn that it's the difficulty that's the good bit. Like yeah. putting the training in and the hard miles it takes to do anything, let alone win an Olympic medal, but is kind of the point of sport because yeah. once you've done it, you've got that sense of satisfaction of having conquered it. But I think kids, I remember when I was a kid, my daughters are 15 and 14, and you know, they're not interested in putting themselves in the, in the way of a difficult half an hour. Yeah. They want to sit in front of the TV. No, it's So the older you get, the more you appreciate it. No, mine are 16 and 18. Oh, really? Yeah. So have um, they kind of got the bug? Um, my lad plays a lot of games. Right. Um, so he'll play cricket as his best sport. Um, hockey, five-a-side football, classic sort of things that, that are quite enjoyable. You know, so it's interesting, isn't it? You say, you know, it's hard. Whereas my daughter did swimming, yeah, and that is hard. Oh. You know, racing, I think racing rather than games is harder. Oh. You know, if you play a game, you get a lot of joyful moments in it, you get a lot of laughs and yeah. fun little things happen. If you're doing a sport like swimming or running or rowing, you know, or putting them all together and doing a triathlon or something, you know, I get you, it's totally, it's hard, isn't it? You've got to enjoy the struggle and, uh, and then feel good after doing it. Well, I used to row for my school when I was a kid. I did you? Were you at school? Uh, Royal Grammar School in Worcester. Okay, yeah. And yeah. We, uh, we did the heads of the river and all the sort of stuff that yeah. I read about in your book. Yeah. And so I, I know I'll come out of what you speak, but I'm just, just amazed that you've had the dedication to do what you do. And it's just must the training. It just blows my mind. Well, I'm amazed you've had the dedication to do this, but well coming up on 10 years without stopping. Well, this is just something small over and over and over again. Yeah. Right? Which is yeah. not that difficult. Yeah. It's a habit though, isn't it? Yeah, I wish I'd save 10 you know. quid for every day I've been running. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have 35 grand, that would be quite useful. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna go right over the bridge. All it's right. a bit narrow. I remember training here when I was a kid and we used to go to the Angel and because they'd serve us beer. We were, okay. only about, we were only about 15. Yeah. But they'd serve us a pint in there. Yeah. So you must be extremely familiar with this bit of river. So I'm very familiar with this bit of river. And just jogging over this bridge, this is where Henley Royal Regatta yeah. happens. Um, so yeah, in the summer, this bridge is pretty hard to get across. I was there on the Thursday sort of this year. Oh, right yeah. yeah. It was uh, lovely. Yeah. We used to hang around the, when we were kids, we used to hang around the, the members bit and 
try yeah. and get people to give us our passes. Oh, so give you yeah, the paper badges as they come yeah. out. That's right, and then we go and uh, try and drown all the people's dregs of pims and okay. lemonade. We get hard left down there. Okay. In behind Leanne the club. So you do. You, there was a big thing in your book about the the rivalry between Leander and Molsey where you were rowing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But you're no, local. So, now. Are you rowing for these guys? So I no, I live in Marlow. Um, I don't really row anymore. I'll come back no, to that no, bit in a second. No, I'm fairly happy to focus on other things. Sure. And the things that are a bit more, yeah, I suppose that I get a bit more of a joy, right. a bit more of a buzz out of. Sure. Rather than just the hard work that comes with the... It's just all hard. With the rowing, you know. It's, a rowing machine is an amazing bit of sports equipment, but it doesn't tend to provide lots of laughs. No. You know, you get on a rowing machine, and it's, you know, it's hard, hard stuff, isn't it? Well, my, my wife has one at home, and she asked me to try and, give, try and get some tips from her. She does half an hour every day. Oh, well, that's and, great. Uh, she's, no, I mean, it's a really good level of focus to do that. God, it's, uh, it's so hard. No, but again, it's the same thing, isn't it? You've got to learn to enjoy the struggle. You've got to learn to say this is worth doing because of the benefits you're getting from it and how good you feel for doing it. Well, you were a pretty young man when you had your first Olympic success with your brother in the double skulls the did you remember a time when he just thought i've got to suck it up i've got to get comfortable with the suffering because um, that's quite a mature attitude yeah i mean i didn't think of it as suffering and i don't think of it as a sacrifice and missing out on other things and that sort of stuff right i always thought of it as just a choice you know you when i was 15 or 16 you know i was making a choice that i wanted to train hard I wanted to try and get into the Hampton School first date, which is where I was at school. You know, if I got in the Hampton first date, yeah. I'd get to race at Henley. You know, here we are, Henley Royal Regatta. Wow. Just coming to the finish line, we'll be here. This is here? This finish line pretty much exactly here. Wow. Um, on the right would be the enclosures. Yeah. These little posts are the yeah. base of the members stand. Oh, right, okay. And there's a big grandstand that sits beside that. I was watching from that bridge over there with this year. Okay, yeah, yeah, on Phyllis Court side. Yes, that's right. So, no, so when I was kind of 16 and onwards, I just always thought I want to be in these situations. I want to be giving myself a chance to win these races. Um, the people I was with, the people I looked up to, all did it. They trained hard, they worked hard. You know, they they chose to push themselves on that rowing machine or in the gym and uh, and I wanted to do that too. How did you balance your education with that? Because well I'm a big believer that you get into good habits like running every day yeah and I bet you're disciplined with other things in your life because you've got to be so I think you know the, the, the good habits come from sport mm -hmm. and then carry over sure now I wasn't the most disciplined student um, and maybe I could have done better, but I did work out what I was good at and I've been able to carry that on into my later life, really. Sure. So I think, you know, again, coming back to the benefits of exercise, I also think for young people, you know, when exams come along, I'm sure you don't have to stop doing your sport. Maybe you back, back off a little bit when it's the day of an exam, so you're not actually falling asleep in the exam. <laughs> but largely, I think you want to keep it going. Keep your good habits in place. So your access sport work, that's, yeah. a, that's a charity that is so, trying to get a bit of this into yeah, so, the younger generation. So access sports, yeah, I mean, the, the, the mission behind the charity is to get children who might be in harder to reach groups opportunities to play sports. And there's probably two big areas. One would be sort of inner city and the other would be disability. Right. So, you know, there's sort of a few sad things about it, really. You know, I came back to race in London 2012 as a 40-year-old because I really loved the idea to inspire a generation. I really want to ask you about that. And, you know, it was, it was right. everywhere. Yeah. Inspire a generation. And we had the Paralympics. You know, the crowds were record-breaking for the Paralympics. Everyone came and loved it. But the reality is that now, I, I think this is accurate, only 20% of uh, kids with disabilities participate in regular sports. But 80% of them want to. Oh, I see. So, so it's not for their want of a desire. It's not that want to. Equipment access. It's just very difficult. Yeah. I mean, I guess if you have a child with a disability, you know, to just show up at a local 
whatever sport club, yeah. there's often not something to set up for you. And if they do come along and find, you know, they don't, don't become part of the center of the group, you know, you're, you get the ball less, you get less opportunities, you don't enjoy it so much, you don't come back. No, of course. So um, Access to Sport helps people to, helps volunteers and coaches and parents to actually run clubs that are fully inclusive. Right. Um, so that's the disability side. And then there's the inner city side. That's a whole different set of it's challenges. a whole different set of challenges. And, you know, we all see the figures on knife crime, and lack of role models, lack of good role models. You know, I was watching a video yesterday with one of our ambassadors. Well, no, sorry, one of our, our uh, participants. And, you know, he's, he's in, a, in a gang. His gang is the boxing club gang. Right. And it's run by firemen who are able to spend their time using the facilities to get, uh, to get young people doing training um, and enjoying the sport and turning to a different gang of young men to hang out with, but doing good, healthy things, you know, growing the self-belief, self-esteem. Oh, I can just imagine it's only good. Absolutely, yeah. And is that, how did you become involved in that, uh, in Access Sport? Access Sport, um, got involved with it around the time of London 2012, around the time when I had kids at the sort of age where, you know, I was not Thank you. holding back on buying a set of swimming goggles or a swimming costume yeah. or a cricket bat or a set of trainers. You start thinking, look how much money you spend on your own kids. And you think, what could that do if you spent a little bit on kids who didn't have opportunities? Sure. How far could that go? So, uh, yes, I found myself getting drawn towards the charity and really enjoying the work I've done with them. Yes, I bet that's extremely rewarding. I'm proud, rewarded. really, of the rewards. Well, you're... So, so, walk me through the chronology of it, because you and your brother were in the Cox this pair, which is an amazing story in itself. Yeah. But that was what year? So, and how old lots of different boats. So I first made the team uh, when I was 18. We got into the Great Britain 8. Um, fantastic couple of years in the 8. Thanks. Oh. And then myself and my brother trialled in the Coxless pair. Managed to beat Redgrave and Pinson. Really? In the Olympic year of 92. Right. We ended up going to the Coxed pair for 92, the two of us, with Gary Herbert lying down inside the boat, yep. talking to us and coaching us along. Yeah. Redgrave and Pinson won the Coxless pair in Barcelona, we won the Cox Fair. Um, and then they took that out of the Olympics, right? They... That's right, yeah, so classic sort of uh, bit of the world we live in these days, bit of a restructure happens around you. Suddenly you can't do the thing you wanted to do. Yeah. And we had to find something else. And the thing we came to was a Cox was four. Right. So I was in a four for three years with a couple of great guys. Uh, Tim Foster and Rupert Opholzer. Right. Tim was to go on and win gold with, of course, with Steve four years later, and we were we were a good four. You know, we were a good four. But I worry whether we really were able to just come together and get the best out of each other. Yeah, um, I read that in your book. You, you weren't operating. You were like two teams of two. Well, rather than one team of four. Yeah, I mean, interesting I think, observation. Well, over the three years, you know, I never tried rowing in a pair with Tim. My brother never really rowed with. Obby, Rupert, I mean, you know, we had two coaches, we trained in two locations for about half the year, and then we sort of put it together and hoped it would work, right. but it would be classically like putting together two teams that are separated, you know, play for different clubs week in, week out, yeah. and not having as much time and emphasis and focus together as you'd like to. And I mean, another little story that goes with it. I remember we went on training camps all around the world. But again, I only ever went in a room with my brother. Yeah. And Tim went with Obby. So in retrospect, that was probably wrong, but it it's didn't the sort feel of like thing, it at the time. You know, it's the, uh, it's the aggregation of marginal cock-ups <laughs> that is not so often talked about. <laughs> you know, yeah. we didn't deliberately do anything wrong. You know, we did a hell of a lot right. But you just think of lots of little things. And when you add them up, they're the little things that made a difference between winning and losing. 
Yes, it must be extremely marginal at your level. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And like I say, our coaches meant well. All four of us were 100% committed to it. We weren't cutting corners and we all wanted to win it. But compared to the sort of situation, the environment the athletes are in now, you know, the light experience in 2012, building up to London, um, what they had for Rio and what they've got for Tokyo, you know, we had other things we needed to do. We had other focuses and that made us good rounded people, hopefully. Right. Um, you know, we were all, all moving on with other things in our lives and rowing. But, you know, possibly in terms of performance, you never know, you know what might have been if we'd been part of the current generation. But there's plenty of athletes in all sports who will be saying that. Yeah, of course. Isn't it? When we look at the fantastic situation we've created now, which, uh, yeah, I was able to be part of in 2012. So you've got a bronze when you're in the Cox. So Four. bronze, so yeah, gold, 92, bronze, 96. And then I also competed in Sydney 2000. Uh, that was in a pair with another guy called Ed Code. Yep. He was a lovely guy. And again, we were probably similar sort of situation. Now, we were together for a year. Um, it was only probably six months of that where we really knew we were going to race the Olympics together. Right. Possibly even less. And, uh, you know, came up against a great, a great French combination who'd been going at it for more like 10 years. Ah. And, uh, you know, it's a lovely story for, with them winning their gold medal. Um, as we came through the third quarter, and the third quarter is always tough in any race. I bet. And uh, as we hit the third quarter, Ed shouted, push now. And at the same time, the French barrowman called the names of their kids, push now. And they went on, took two lengths off all of us and won the gold medal. Really? Yeah. How fabulous. It's a lovely sort of story, isn't it? Incredible. For the connection that they had. And like I say, Ed and I were strong, physical. You know, we were hungry. We really wanted it. We trained hard. But, you know, when you hear of that kind of connection that they had and we just didn't quite. And then I think in reality, it would be... You know, on other days, we'd probably been the second best crew in the race and probably should have made an effort and you know, hung on and won a silver. As it was, we got beaten by a couple of boats oh, who that must have been you know, had a good day. You know, they, they delivered when it mattered and they ended up with the medals around their necks. But I wonder if we should have really oh, sure. done better. But you've got a goal, you they can't. Like, so, yeah. Nobody's ever going to take that away from you. So, this is, uh, the, this is the start of back here, uh, right? Of the... This is Temple Island, just to the top, actually. Right. Yeah, it's a bit of me drawn towards getting to the top of the island. Isn't it? I don't know if we're halfway yet in our run, I just think we probably are. Yeah, we're more than halfway, but that's fine. Yeah. I could run all day, I can, I've certainly got enough to no. talk about. It's fascinating. Well, we'll run just a bit further so we get to the top of Temple Island. So yeah, Henley Regatta. What does it feel like to be sat here on the... Right, in, waiting and amazing. getting your boat in line and... It feels amazing. I used to get nervous as hell. Oh, you're nervous doing... as hell. But it's what you're prepared for, isn't it? Just, uh... And you've, rode, you've raced in all sorts of boats. I've raced at Henley Royal Regatta. You, you... Numerous boats. I'm now part of organising it. Oh. So I now come around and I'm timing them. And oh, you're on the boats, huh? Aligning them and checking the groups are all ready to do what they're meant to do. So now this is uh, pretty well on the start line. Well, yeah. I imagine this plaque probably marks it here. Yeah. To the finish. You know, shit, it's exactly start two miles line. from where we started, coincidentally. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. There you go. Two miles from the car park. Yes. And, uh, One yeah. mile, 550 yards. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, we so, were sat over there in the boat watching the starts and it was just giving me the creep. Yeah. Just, just remembering what it was like, the nerves and the anxiety and knowing we've got... Well, how long does it take? So, depending what sort of boat you're in, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the quickest is an eight. Uh, and I'm pretty sure in 2011 we did sub six minutes. Jesus. So, six minutes. Uh, which sadly wasn't the course record because the Germans did it at about 5.58 that day. Wow. So uh, it was one of the fastest to go down the course, but we lost out to the German eight that year. Um, but no, so an eight would be a quick eight around six minutes or close to six minutes. 
through to uh, a single and you're looking more like high sevens you know maybe even up towards eight minutes depending on if you catch a headwind and how stiff the competition is now you won in the single skull right yeah here. that must have been quite that was a sad. wonderful experience i bet in fact racing here at henley in in the events when you're younger is actually more fun than when you're a bit older right and the reason for that is i got to race here in my schoolboy eight so my school eight there was 32 entries started on the Wednesday right? and it's like a Wimbledon draw kind of situation uh -huh. where by the Thursday there's only 16 left and then by Friday there's, there's eight left Saturday two semi-finals with only four left and then by the Sunday there's only two of you left and you race a final like you do on finals day at Wimbledon and uh, that, must feel and that feels pretty special because you've had to work for it over five days you know it's about looking after yourself well and finding your way through the regatta, racing day after day. And what are you doing in between racing? I mean, presumably you're supposed to be resting. Well, funny you cool. say that, yeah. What are you doing? We stayed at Remenham Church Hall. Oh, I stayed there when I, I was there on the left. When I was training, I was... Did you? Slept, yeah. Slept on the floor in sleeping we, bags. We were sleeping on the floor in sleeping bags. How funny. With our uh, different parents having a couple of days <laughs> or a day each to bring up a lasagna or a pasta or a shepherd's pie. <laughs> and then we would eat that and rest and... Watch come down, watch a few races, try not to get too nervous. Yeah. Um, the final was amazing though, wasn't it? I raced the final here. It was actually that year. My first year when I was 16. Hampton School against Eton College. And at that time, I guess Eton was still, as it is now, very much the, you know, the, the top, yeah. most expensive, best funded school in the country, if not the world. Yeah. And then there was us as a former grammar school um, with not many people rowing in the school at all you know probably we could just about put together two eights and a four you were the upstarts we were the upstarts yeah, good for you guys. and uh, everybody loves an underdog so to race as, as underdogs really although we were training hard and we expected to win but uh, yeah and that year they had Matthew Pinson in the all right Eton College crew and uh, so to beat him and his crew was fantastic and racing, like you say, here as a 16-year-old in front of, you know, 60,000 people. Yeah. It's pretty special. That must have the roar of the... Yeah. Because all the, reg all the regattas I ever rode were pretty parochial yeah. country ones. The, the sideway head is... Yeah. The river's so wide you can't hear anything anyway. That's right. You <laughs> do the sideway head, don't you? You do the, uh, school, the national schools, go up to Nottingham. Yeah, I missed that because I was sick. Nottingham gets a good atmosphere, but it's largely... Uh, it's everyone's parents and supporters, right? You know, parents and friends, rather than what you get here, which is a lot of people at the regatta. Some of them are facing the river and watching what's happening. Yes, that's right. A lot of them are facing the champagne bar. Yeah. Uh, it's more of a social occasion, I suppose, really. It's a great reunion. Oh, here we go. Kind of opportunity, isn't it? Mm. Cheers. You saw us coming. Yeah, luckily. Yeah. Um, so, you won, how old were you when you, when you so, won the gold with your brother? So, yeah, so. 19? So, no, 20. 20. In 92. And then you went again. And then. And you were, what, 40 when you won the second? Yeah, so I did the Sydney one that I spoke about. Yeah. Where we came fourth. Obviously felt a bit disappointed. Um, but was ready to move on with life, really. Right. Started and a family. You, yeah, how old were you that time? 28. Right, so your perspective must have been very different. Yeah, and then I was able to reflect and think about what I could have done better. And then I was really ready to move on uh, until the London Olympics were selected and we knew we were going to host. Right. And then as the host nation, I could see we were going to do the, uh, the rowing. And it was going to be half an hour from my house. <laughs> and the Olympics were going to happen. Not only were they going to happen half an hour from my house, but I did the maths and could see they were going to give out gold medals on the 2nd of August 2012. Right. I would be 40, <laughs> and I'd won a gold medal on the 2nd of August 92 as a 20 year old. Wow. So I could see the sort of the story was too synergy good. of it. Yeah, too good to me. To go, okay, I did it at 20, let's come back and try and do it at 40. And were you involved in rowing as a discipline at that time? Were you, yeah, like, in a few ways. So I was doing 
some sort of training and racing and actually raced here as a whatever sort of 35 year old 36 year old and uh, considering I was training twice a week still quite competitive and I found myself racing against people who were training twice a day oh. and looking towards the, the London Olympics right. and at that time I thought well look if I train you know, anything like as much as this lot do I reckon I could still be competitive if my body holds up to it so uh, yeah, about three years out from the London Games decided I wanted to give it another go and uh, it was a wonderful three years but you joined at eight. There was no more sculling or anything like that. You wanted, no. to, you wanted some camaraderie. I, I had to show myself in a single because otherwise you never know really quite who's doing what. Right. So yeah, I had to get scores on a rowing machine over 2,000 metres and 5,000 metres. And you, at one time you held the world record for that, didn't you? Did actually, yeah. <laughs> Just a, yeah, the, the, 2K. The sheer enormity of that and the sort yeah, of pain that you have to go through. Must have been about 24. Uh, yeah, and at one stage, yeah, I did have the world best of 5.44, <laughs> which is holding about a 126 average for three 500s, four 500s. That's unbelievable. Which was pretty full on. No kidding. I wouldn't even want to get it there for, for 10 strokes now. No, I bet. Let alone 500. Oh, my wife will hear this and just, yeah. she'll understand that and go bananas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you rode in the single. So yeah. I had to show myself in the single. Yeah in the late 2009 early 2010 and then i've worked my way through the selection and uh, the eight was probably our lowest ranked boat in 2010 um but i got to be part of that team wow and for me it was in many ways my best year of my comeback really yeah because we were with uh i guess the underdog thing again really mm. A group of people, not many of whom had had the highest level of success, um, but we really came together, really clear on our approach. Were you the oldest guy in the boat? Our beliefs. I was considerably the oldest in the boat. And did anybody feel that your story was keeping them out of a place in the boat? Uh, well, did they? Not really. Everybody. The good thing about the coaching system was it was pretty transparent pretty clear what you had to do to get in right so you, you earned it on merit not just and we were all together training every day together right so to me it, it always looked pretty obvious who was in and who wasn't and there's always going to be a few decisions on the margin but i managed to keep myself pretty well away from the margin really good for you uh, and at 40 that's a whole different ball yeah yeah how old are you now uh, 47 now right yeah you're uh, we're similar ages and i know that yeah i started this running streak at just before I turned 40. Yeah. And that was difficult, but I can't imagine yeah. what it must have been like to try and recapture some of the energy to train that you had 20 years previously. That's an astonishing yeah. thing. Yeah. No, but it was, a, it was a joyful thing as well. You know, I really did enjoy every day of it because I was very, yeah. I suppose, very self aware. You know, the impact that I had on other people. Hopefully I was able to manage myself, you know, physically and emotionally. And uh, the best way I can say it really is I was like one of those mature students. <laughs> right, yeah. He's kind of yeah, that makes... taking every day really seriously and enjoying it. And... Yeah, doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. So I'm intrigued when he said when we were running in the opposite direction here that you don't row much anymore. No. So you, obviously you're a fit guy. How do you, uh, well, how do you keep in shape? So... I don't want to let that go. I try to do something a bit like you're doing, you know, to do some activity every day. Yeah. But that could just be walking the dog or playing golf. Right. Uh, I played cricket in the same team as my son <laughs> for a couple of years, a couple of summers together. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy to stay active and healthy so why no without running? needing to push the limits. Because well, you've got so much to pass on in terms yeah. of knowledge and experience. Well, with the rowing, there's actually been a a little downside as well. I had a bit of a heart issue. Jesus. Yeah, so I had a bit of a heart thing oh. uh, where my heart went out of rhythm oh. called atrial fibrillation. Right. So my heart. How did, you, how did that manifest itself? Um, I entered a triathlon. <laughs> I was going to do a triathlon in Italy. Yeah. And luckily, Italy has very good sort of cardio screening. Right. 
and they wouldn't let me compete until I'd been for a medical. And I thought, well, look, I did the Olympics a year ago. Yeah. I'm sure I'm going to be fine. Yeah, I just thought the same. And I showed up for my medical and this little doctor in Sardinia and uh, put me through a few tests, simple blood pressure. Right. And uh, my heart had, had fallen out of rhythm. How strange. It's clear it must have happened in the last few months because I could never have done the Olympics with it in the condition it was in. Right. And they, uh, they said, look, you, you know, you need... You need to do something to try and put your heart back in rhythm. How did you do that? I went for a shock. No way. So the whole sort of, it's called cardio version. Jesus, they put a Basically, you. Basically, stand clear. While you were... No, you were... I was sedated. Oh. So they did it in a managed way. So I had to wait for a couple of months while I thinned my blood. Right. To make sure there was nothing that would get moving. Yeah. And be untoward. Yeah, went in, got shocked. And that was... Uh, and that, over five years ago. And that just sort of reset it into the proper rhythm. There's no light damage it. or anything like that. Well, I'm back in rhythm now and have been for five years. It seems to be a pretty good... But the advice <laughs> was don't become an athlete again. Right. So don't do... Um, no, don't go and do the big cycling through the Alps yeah. trips. Don't try and do a London marathon. Um, go for a jog like this. Sure. Uh, do a park run. I think park runs are wonderful thing. Mm, they are. Um, you know, if you want to do some strength training, go to the gym and lift some weights. Sure. But don't put yourself in, you know, a crazy, what can I say, you know, CrossFit team. Yeah. And and be the guy who's there at the end well, if, doing well, the session where your eyeballs are popping. Well, of all the people I've ever met, and certainly the ones I've ever run with, nobody needs to prove it any less than you get. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. You've, uh... No, and so I feel like I don't have anything to prove. No. And I'm quite a goal-focused person. So if you give me goals and put me in teams, I, I want to right. give my best and I want to support the team. So I just choose that that's going to be a cricket team where I'll try and, you know, bat long and not get out. Or I'll try and hold my catches. <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to be the person who's going to be sitting on the front of the cycling peloton. No, for sure. Dragging people up mountains. Fair enough. It's just a different choice. And what's it like, like after being a celebrated athlete? I mean, how do you transition to the real world? Yeah. I mean, I think it's becoming harder for young people. For me, I've always had other things going on in my life. So, you know, I always worked, studied to start with, then had a job. It's so hard working doing in that. working and working in leadership development, working yeah. with teams. So the crossover, of what I was doing in my sport, was fairly easy to what I've always done in my work. Right. Um, and I've looked to carry that on. And I think in terms of transition as an athlete, you know, when you have a family you care about, you know, involved in their lives, that all helps because you have other things that you believe to be important. Yeah as well as believing that sport's important. And I think that's really helped me. Are you, uh, you're involved in the uh, Henley organization, you said. Yeah. You must just still have some connections with organized sport. Yeah, so I do, uh, I'm a Henley steward, so I'm part of organizing this every year. Yeah. Uh, I, I help with world rowing. Um, and I commentate at uh, the World Championships and the World Cup regattas when they need me to. Um, so, and so charity. Pretty, pretty nice, sir. Yeah, doing charity stuff with Access Sport. Yeah. Again, keeps me close to sport without needing to put my lycra on. <laughs> and I'm fairly happy to keep it that way. <laughs> well, I really, really do appreciate you putting your lycra on for me today. It's been really no. fascinating. You're obviously extremely fit. You've We've carried on the conversation without any great... Well, we've been at a reasonable pace, haven't we? Nothing special. Yeah, it's eight-minute eight but... mile pace, that's all right. Yeah, no. We do this all day. Yeah. No, well, this was... Would... Do you go on and do longer things? Have you Occasionally. put in any other I can... I might... half marathons? Or... My stick is just running at least three miles every day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not stopping. My, yeah. high, my high score is sufficiently high that I just don't want to do it. Don't want to stop anymore. No, I totally get that. And uh, it's really sort of changed my life for the better. 
I've met yeah. a bunch of interesting people through doing this YouTube channel, which has been fabulous. I've, uh, yeah. I've uh, run with some fascinating folk, heard some interesting stories. Yeah. But really, this was just my day's run, right? Yeah. Like, I'm going to do this again. How far tomorrow. and wide have you travelled? Well, well, I've travelled for work all over the yeah. place. North America mostly and Europe. And occasionally it's a drag. I had to get up at 3 a.m. last week when I, was, yeah. when I had a flight to Paris to catch. That was a bit of a drag. But yeah. Ordinarily, it's pretty good. Yeah. I've uh, inspired a couple of people to pick up this running streak idea just because it's easier to run. Well, like I said, do something every day, not yeah. just some days. No. Because some days become very few days. Yeah. If you've got an excuse to not do something. No. And I'm a great one for finding excuses. Yeah, no, no, I love it. I love what you're doing. Well, I wish uh, more people would take up running because it always gives more than it takes. Yes. Running, and uh, even if you're, well, I'll be tired after this, I've got to drive and pick my kids up. And, yeah. But I feel good because I've yeah. done something. You know? no, the, we have done four miles, time. which is about perfect. Had a good chat. Yeah. Now, the feel good side of it's huge, isn't it? Well, yeah, people talk about endorphins, but it's yeah. the pleasure of doing something difficult. Yeah, right? yeah. There's absolute satisfaction now. Oh. Well, uh, Yeah, we're about right. I'm actually staying at the River and Rowing Museum tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, do you remember the women's pair, which was Helen Glover and Heather Stanning? Yeah. Won our first gold medal in London 2012. And they're uh, unveiling their boat. Oh, right. Uh, in an exhibition here at the River and Rowing Museum. How exciting. And I'm the uh, compere. Oh, yeah, that's good. Cool. So they're going to just ask them questions and get them talking. Oh, that's Along fantastic. with their coach, who's a lovely bloke. It must be very nice to be a sort of elder statesman of the sport. And rowing yeah. changed immeasurably since I was doing it. Yeah. Like it was just private schools and yeah. the odd club when I yeah. when I was running. No, well yeah, we've hopefully changed the demographic somewhat. Still got a way to go. Um, but yeah, I want to get more people involved in it, enjoying it, and getting the benefits from it. Well, in that in almost exactly four miles. Well, thanks ever so much. Okay, so no, that was pleasure. really. Thanks for getting me out. Fabulous, yeah. Well, you've done a run today. There you go. Yeah. That's something you wouldn't have done yeah. otherwise, would <laughs> you? Yeah. Right, so we'll leave it. We'll stop it here. I'll okay. stop the video. Sir, thank you so Good much. Good stuff, no, thanks very it much. It was a thanks real, real pleasure. It's an honour to meet you. You've just done some amazing stuff. and. It <laughs> blows my mind that you can win. You can do all that training to win a gold at 20. And yeah. then come back and win a bronze at 40. It's just, yeah. if you, you can do that, anybody can do anything. It's yeah. astonishing. Well, I think, you know, you, like you say, you've got to enjoy, enjoy a bit of struggle, but just enjoy the whole thing along the way. I yeah, think. well, that's, uh, yeah, those are words to live by. Well, yeah. thanks for the three miles, well, four miles, actually. Yeah. That's been brilliant. Um, uh, and I'll link you to this on YouTube. And no, all let's that do that. That'd be nice. And if you like it, subscribe and all that sort of jazz. Thanks again. Good stuff. No, thank you.